This presentation reveals the seal of God. What is the real meaning of this seal? Is it important to have this special seal? How can you and I make sure of receiving the seal of God? You will find all the answers to these vital questions. So listen carefully and check your own Bible to see if it corresponds with what Francois is saying. In our previous lecture we discovered the prophetic message of the four horses of Revelation chapter 6. They represent the first four seals in a series of seven. When mankind rejected the saving message of the white horse, they reaped a red harvest of war, a black harvest of famine, and a pale harvest of death. Whenever we reject light, we reap darkness. Whenever we reject truth, we reap a harvest of error. The fifth seal mentioned the persecution of millions of martyrs. Metaphorically, their blood cries out for revenge. With the opening of the sixth seal, there was a devastating earthquake, a solar eclipse and a meteoric shower. When the seventh seal was opened, there was a half an hour silence in heaven. Why? Because all the angels of heaven accompanied Jesus on his way to fetch his children. But who will be saved in that day? In chapter 7, John describes the characteristics of the sealed and saved 144,000. Why? Because only those who have the seal of God will be saved in these last days. The characteristics of the sealed 144,000 are repeated in Revelation chapter 14. John also gives us a detailed description of the message they will proclaim. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Verse 2 Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Verse 3 do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Verse 4 Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, a hundred and forty-four thousand from all the tribes of Israel. Now if this is a little number, then the tribes of Ephraim and Dan are lost because they are not listed. If this chapter speaks about spiritual Israel and the number is symbolic, then you and I have a chance. John heard the number and now he's going to see who they are. This will give you new hope. Verse 9 After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Verse 10, And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Verse 13, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? Verse 14, I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15 Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread out his tent over them. Verse 16 Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. Verse 17 says, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. From this information concerning the 144,000 sealed ones, it becomes clear that they will be alive when Jesus comes. It is a symbolic figure, 12 times 12 times a thousand. They are from every nation, tribe, people and language. Let us read about them again and determine to be one of them. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, 
holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on any tree. God is holding back the winds of war and strife in these last days in order to seal us. But what is God's seal? Verses 2 and 3 Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. God is holding back the winds of war and destruction in these last days in order to seal us. But what is God's seal? The Bible teaches that the seal of God is contained in the fourth commandment, the Sabbath command. But the observance of this holy day must also be characterized by holy living. The receiving of the seal is still future. Let's read a parallel passage from Revelation 14 verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty-four thousand to add his name, and his father's name written on their foreheads. God's name is synonymous with his character. His seal will only be placed on those who reflect his character. In ancient times, a seal served as a signature of the owner. It also identified his authority and territory. Does the Sabbath also serve as the signature of God? Does it identify his authority and territory? Yes, it does. They found this seal of Shema at Megiddo. Once this seal was impressed on a clay tablet, that specific article became the property of Shema, the servant of Jeroboam. Are you getting the beautiful message of the Sabbath? Before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, God's servants had to be sealed for protection against the divine judgments. Let's read it, Ezekiel 9 verse 4. And said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. Are we grieving because of the detestable things happening around us? In order to save us from the coming doom and prepare us for his second coming, the Lord has to seal us. This involves the work of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to keep the Sabbath, which contains the seal, without the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Before we look at the biblical definition of the seal of God, let's examine the three characteristics of an ordinary seal. We have a name, a title, and a territory. You will also find these three characteristics in an ordinary Egyptian seal, the name of the person, his title, as well as his territory. A seal is a mark or sign of authority and is used by rulers and officials to validate laws and agreements. Isaiah 8 verse 16 says, God's seal is in the law. Now which of the Ten Commandments mention three of God's characteristics? The fourth. Let's read it. Exodus 28 to 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fourth commandment, written with the finger of God, contains all three elements of a seal. His name, the Lord thy God, his title, creator or maker, and his territory, heaven and earth. What a discovery! You've got to be sealed with the seal of God, contained in the Sabbath before his second coming. The harlot of Revelation 17 intoxicates the churches with a wine of a false doctrine. Will the remnant, the sealed of God, be intoxicated doctrinally with the wine of Babylon? No. Listen to what Revelation 14 verses 4 and 5 says. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. 
They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. God's remnant church, His last church on earth, will be free from every false doctrine from the great Babylonian apostasy. The enemy's imitation for God's through Sabbath is the spurious one called Sunday. In a future lecture we will hear more about this mark of papal authority. Isaiah 56 verses 1 and 2 predicts that the beautiful salvation message of the Sabbath is to be restored before the second coming of Jesus. Let's read about it. This is what the Lord says, Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Chapter 58 verse 12 predicted that there would be a people restoring this beautiful truth at the end of time. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Verse 13 If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way, and not doing as you please or speaking idle words. In verse 14 the prophet tells us about the wonderful reward of genuine Sabbath keeping in these last days. Then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land, and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Revelation 14 says that God's last appeal to the inhabitants of the world is the acceptance of his unmerited salvation which is inseparable from Sabbath worship. Tell me, why is God so jealous about his Sabbath? Why the urgent appeal in these end times for people to worship him on the Sabbath? Well, there are two main reasons. First of all, the Sabbath is a sign of God's creatorship. And secondly, it is a symbol of his salvation. The devil does not like this. Adam and Eve, who were created on Friday, received the unique gift of holy time, the Sabbath, before they started enjoyable work on the planet which they received from God. Let's read about it. Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. What a fantastic gift. He rested on the Sabbath. In other words, he made himself available for special communication with man. He blessed and sanctified the seventh day. In giving them the Sabbath, God was telling them that a meaningful relationship with him is the most important thing in this world. Before any kind of human activity begins, there must first be a time of spiritual rest in God. He wanted Adam and Eve to celebrate the Sabbath in commemoration of the fact that he was their kind and selfish creator. At Sinai, the very same message was codified and repeated. Exodus 20 verses 8 to 10 Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. Why? Because God wants to extend our kindness to everyone in our influence sphere. This holy command does not only talk about physical rest, People around us should also experience the rest that comes from our kindness and forgiveness towards them.
Verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. By worshipping him on the Sabbath, we acknowledge him as our creator who takes care of all our human frailties. By doing this, God places his seal of approval on us. In the Sinai and Negev deserts, Israel celebrated 2,080 miraculous Sabbaths over a period of 40 years. From Sunday to Friday, a very special food from heaven called manna appeared like frost on the ground. Moses said it was the bread that God gave them. If they tried to preserve the manna for the next day, it went bad, except on the Sabbath. God was telling them that he wanted to reveal himself in a very special way to them on the Sabbath. On a Friday they had to gather twice as much. Why? God wanted them to rest on the Sabbath and have sweet fellowship with him and with one another. Exodus 16.32 He said to them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Friday was a day of preparation for Sabbath. Why? God wanted them to be physically and spiritually prepared to receive the abundant blessings of the Sabbath. Down through the ages, whenever the sun sets over the Holy Land on a Friday, people knew that God's special day was approaching, and someone would announce it by blowing on the shofar, a ram's horn. It echoed down every street and alley and corridor. By the time it blew the third time, the day of the Lord was just about to begin. In a million homes, mothers lit the wicks of their olive oil lamps. As the flickering yellow flames leaped upward, the people in the home got the message. The flame was a symbol of the light of God that dispels darkness. The light reminded them that God is the mighty creator. In awe, reverence and joy, the people of God prepared their hearts for the special day. And a million whispers reverberated throughout the land saying, The Sabbath has begun to shine. God is our mighty creator. Fathers with their families around them prayed with heartfelt gratitude. Blessed art thou, O creator, for the gift of the Sabbath. And then one day the creator himself became man and dwelt among his people. He taught them that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 4.16 So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. While Jesus was still living in Nazareth, he closed his carpenter's shop on a Sabbath and worshipped on this holy day as he himself instituted at creation. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill Matthew 5.17. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Verse 18 Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 19 Did the disciples who followed Christ observe the Sabbath as he did? Did they use Friday as a day for preparing for the coming of the Sabbath? Yes, they did. Let's read from Luke 23 verse 54 what happened on the Friday when Jesus was crucified. That day was preparation and the Sabbath drew near. 55 and the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Jesus celebrated the creation of our planet on that Friday long ago by resting on the Sabbath. 
And then when he recreated sinners on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, he again celebrated our salvation by resting in the tomb on the Sabbath. After his disciples prepared the spices and perfumes for his body on Friday, they hallowed the Sabbath as their master taught them to do. On Sunday they went back to the tomb to do hard work, the work of embalming his body. May we ask the question, who changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day? God didn't, Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Who changed the Bible Sabbath? Jesus didn't, let's read it, Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Well, who changed the Sabbath? The disciples didn't. Let's read it. Acts 5.29 But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. If Christ and the disciples did not change the Sabbath, who did? We've answered this question before, but let's answer it again. Question. Which day is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. This comes from the convert's catechism of Catholic doctrine. The devil hates the Sabbath, the symbol of God the Creator and God the Recreator because he, the devil, cannot create and he cannot recreate. He can only destroy. Let us briefly look at the relationship between the Sabbath and salvation in Exodus 31 verse 13. Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that they may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Tell me, according to this verse, can I sanctify myself? No. Every Sabbath should be a reminder, my friend, that we are saved by grace. It says to the sinner who is trying so hard but failing so miserably to come and rest in the salvation that Jesus Christ has wrought for us. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. Do you think the devil is happy with this truth? No, of course not. Deuteronomy 5 verses 12 to 15 Observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or your maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, nor any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Now listen to this tremendous incentive to keep the Sabbath holy. It says, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, because you were saved by grace, therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the seventh day. Exodus 14.14 14 tells us how God rescued them. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. My dear friend, by worshipping God on his Sabbath, we acknowledge the fact that he is the one that's more than willing to fight all our battles. What a divine incentive to worship him on the Sabbath day. There was another exodus when Jesus was crucified. The exodus from our sinful past to God's forgiving grace. If you feel too great a sinner to be saved one day, then listen to these encouraging words. I will fight for you, and I will save you. Trust me fully with your sin problem. Malagasy birds stay close to one another and never separate. Through Sabbath observance, God wants to establish a very special relationship that will last throughout eternity. 
Isaiah 66 verses 22 and 23 For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The Sabbath will always remain the sign of God as the Creator and the Recreator throughout eternity. I cannot wait for that day because this poor sinner cannot really appreciate what price God has paid for me on Calvary. Ezekiel 36 verse 27 And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. What an offer! If it is your desire to worship God on His Holy Sabbath, the Holy Spirit will enable you to keep God's Holy Sabbath. Hebrews 4 verses 9 to 11 There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Because Jesus died for me, I want to respond positively to his appeal to worship him on his holy Sabbath. What about you? Perhaps this information came to you as a surprise. Nevertheless, the bigger question is, how am I responding on matters of truth? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is our desire to receive the seal of God. Please help us to respond positively on your appeal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't miss the next lecture on Revelation 12. There are more surprises waiting for you.